Hi, everyone. Welcome to our channel, Begin Your Journey. The neighborhood near Moscow, purportedly only about 10 minutes from President Putin's official residence, has witnessed a significant explosion, possibly caused by an explosive device of considerable size, estimated by Colonel Tony Schaffer to be between 500 to 1,000 LBs. The red flash at the beginning of the explosion indicates the magnitude of the blast. The question, Arisha, how did this event transpire in a residential area? And is President Zelensky acting independently, or does the U.S. approve of such actions? The circumstances surrounding this incident remain unclear, prompting speculation about potential loose cannons and geopolitical implications. Douglas McGregor reports that the recent attack originated from within Russia, highlighting the challenges of securing its extensive 1,100-mile border. Despite attempts to defend against such incidents, the border's vast and often forested terrain makes it inherently difficult. Reports indicate approximately 19 drones were launched, with all but three being successfully intercepted. These three drones exploded harmlessly on the ground. Margaret expresses skepticism regarding the claimed size of the payload, suggesting that smaller explosives may appear larger depending on the camera angle. He questions the notion of a 400 to 1,000-pound bomb suspecting the use of Orlan drones from the Soviet era with a maximum payload of around 30 to 40 pounds of explosives. Douglas McGregor shares insights into the recent drone attack near Moscow, indicating that the drones originating from Russia likely encountered issues causing them to lose momentum. He suggests potential factors such as running out of fuel or encountering motor problems. McGregor raises the possibility of Russian jamming systems disrupting the drones, highlighting the effectiveness of Russia's advanced jamming technology capable of countering hundreds of Ukrainian drones daily. He also notes the existence of evidence suggesting the involvement of the SAFE PS Special Air Service in infiltrating Russia and launching these attacks, emphasizing uncertainty about the source of the incident. Douglas MacGregor suggests that the Special Air Service, thus the British Special Operations equivalent, likely claim responsibility for the attempted bridge disablement between Crimea and Russia. He acknowledges the S's expertise in such covert operations and considers it a plausible scenario. McGregor speculates on the involvement of Ukrainians in the operation, emphasizing that if they were Ukrainian, someone with expertise likely assisted. He questions whether American intelligence might have been aware of the operation, and if so, whether entities like the Department of Defense of Dodd, the Department of State, or the National Security Council received information about it. This inquiry aims to discern if President Putin could argue that Joe Biden or someone within his administration ordered an attack on his residence. Douglas McGregor suggests that President Biden would likely invoke plausible deniability, claiming ignorance or lack of direct involvement in the specific operation. However, McGregor underscores the reality that all actions are informed by data provided to the U.S., including surveillance, overhead photography, and detailed information. While acknowledging that intelligence support is unequivocally present, he emphasizes the potential use of plausible deniability to distance the administration from direct foreknowledge of the operation's timing. According to Douglas McGregor, the U.S. emphasizes that it doesn't dictate where Ukraine should strike or how to conduct operations inside Russia. While providing equipment, training, and advice, the ultimate decisions rest with President Zelensky and Ukrainian military commanders. McGregor asserts that the U.S. has made it clear that it doesn't support or encourage attacks inside Russia. In response to this, McGregor draws a parallel to a famous statement from another public figure, suggesting that Zelensky's assurance may be akin to past instances where public figures made denials that were later proven false. He expresses skepticism about taking Zelensky's statement at face value, implying a lack of trust in its sincerity. Douglas McGregor argues that a potent combination of arrogance and self-delusion characterizes many in Washington. He contends that a majority of individuals in the Capitol continue to perceive Russia through the lens of the mid-1990s, viewing it as a failed state with a weak economy and a society on the brink of revolt. McGregor asserts that these beliefs are false, emphasizing Russia's strong economy, 
abundant resources and enduring capabilities. He further highlights the persistence of these delusions and links them with an arrogance that assumes the U.S. military is still on par with its 1991 status, despite the erosion of advantages in key areas over time. A drone base in Crimea, where drones provided by Iran to Russia are launched, contains essential command and control sites crucial for Russia's control over the entire territory, including the land bridge. Additionally, Crimea hosts significant military installations that Russia has transformed into vital logistics and back office depots for the ongoing war. According to the information presented, Ukraine is targeting these facilities, and there is alleged support from external sources, potentially including the United States. Yes, she is providing accurate information. However, I don't endorse her policy stance. She could have been an effective spokesperson for the Soviet armed forces during the heroic defense against the Germans in 1941, though we know that narrative didn't align with reality. It's important to recognize her as part of a partisan group committed to maintaining a certain narrative and taking any necessary actions to sustain it, even if it involves deception. Well, two types of fools. The harmless ones who tell jokes and are self-deprecating, and the dangerous ones. In this case, the individual falls into the second category, a dangerous fool. He lacks an understanding of the consequences of our actions, which could potentially escalate and affect not only Europe, but also the United States. Russia is not just a significant power. It is one of the great powers globally. Unfortunately, he seems content with delusions and arrogance, refusing to acknowledge the reality of the situation. The Senate is a peculiar place, resembling a political fantasy land. It's like Mount Olympus with a circus on top where people often engage in grandiose speeches without being held accountable. This individual is skilled at saying things for dramatic effect, seemingly oblivious to the fact that there are serious consequences. Dragging us into a major war with Russia would be catastrophic for the United States, Europe, and Russia. He's a combat lawyer, keep in mind. His experience includes serving as an attorney in locations such as Iraq and Afghanistan, working on the staff of generals. Despite this, his understanding of war seems limited. Individuals like him are perilous because they fail to grasp the consequences of their actions and words. He seems to believe there won't be repercussions, but he is mistaken. Unfortunately, we may witness the fallout of his misjudgments in the near future. Deputy Secretary of State Newland made statements over the weekend, and it's unclear exactly to whom she's addressing. The context suggests she might be speaking to Ukrainian leaders or elites, potentially through a virtual platform. Nevertheless, her admissions and expectations raise noteworthy points worth discussing. Douglas McGregor expresses his surprise at Deputy Secretary of State Newland publicly acknowledging collaboration on the offensive that has been discussed since winter. He questions the wisdom of openly admitting to a months-long partnership between various entities such as the State Department, CIA, Department of Defense, Dodd, and the administration, emphasizing the potential risks associated with such revelations. Douglas McGregor notes Deputy Secretary of State Newland's apparent pride in openly associating herself with the broader campaign to dismantle Russia. He acknowledges her honesty and suggests that there has been extensive effort over many months to coordinate and prepare for the offensive, especially as the training of Ukrainian soldiers in various countries, including the United States, Canada, Germany, and the Czech Republic, has been ongoing. Douglas McGregor asserts that she is indeed conveying the truth, and she takes great pride in that. The more intriguing aspect lies in the second part, drawing a parallel that brings to mind a scene reminiscent of the movie Downfall. In the film's climax, just before Hitler takes his own life in the bunker, a woman approaches him, questioning inevitable victory. His response is a poignant turn of the head, retreating into the room to end his life. A similar situation is unfolding here, uh, akin to placing the cart far ahead of the horse, destined never to reach that cart. It's a scenario where they'll find themselves next to a lifeless horse, a consequence of prematurely endorsing the I Believe button. Douglas McGregor emphasizes that to align with the current administration and the prevailing war fervor, one must unquestionably endorse the Believe button. 
<laughs> expressing skepticism or presenting a rational viewpoint, asserting that the notion of an inevitable victory is utterly absurd leads to immediate expulsion from meetings. This echoes the pattern observed in the intelligence community, where credible assessments detailing the actual situation in Ukraine and Russia rarely ascend to the highest echelons because they diverge from the established narrative. Over time, the narrative morphs into a perceived truth, demanding unwavering belief and defense. A messenger who genuinely embraces the falsehood they convey proves to be the most potent advocate. The ongoing counteroffensive, a collaborative effort spanning the past four or five months, is now advancing into discussions with the Ukrainian government and associates in Kyiv, encompassing both civilian and military aspects of Ukraine's future. Ukraine's long-term prospects are becoming a focal point of dialogue. Remarkably, the United States Department is engaging in conversations regarding Ukraine's future. Questions naturally arise. Does it encompass President Zelensky, or will it be shaped under the influence of Mrs. Newland, much like her previous involvement? Douglas McGregor points out that evidence of strategic planning surfaced several months ago when a photo captured Mr. Zelensky seated alongside the now exposed fraudster, Bank Freedom, and Larry Fink from BlackRock. These individuals, including other key figures, play pivotal roles in determining Ukraine's fate. Once they, in their words, emerge victorious. Expressing reservations, McGregor questions the wisdom of entrusting the future of anything, let alone a place like his home state or the city of his upbringing, to these particular individuals. It raises a broader concern about the influential forces stirring this course. MacGregor underscores the importance of scrutinizing the oligarchs and highlights his recurrent theme of government by donor. The government in Washington isn't concerned with the average citizen, neither you nor me. Our relevance is minimal. It's the mega donors who wield influence and own the nation's capital, shaping critical decisions. Douglas McGregor emphasizes the need to identify these influential figures, such as Zuckerberg and others who contribute substantial sums, effectively molding policies like the unwavering commitment to Ukraine. McGregor doesn't mince words, stating that Biden is essentially a frontman handed a script that he delivers with enthusiasm. This reality, he contends, should not come as a surprise to the American people. And the crucial question is how long they'll tolerate it. McGregor dismisses the hope of finding a champion on the right, asserting that many on that side of the spectrum are also beholden to the same donors. He challenges the audience to seek out someone not owned by donors and observe their actions. As a side note, it's conceivable that Congressman Andy Biggs is grappling with significant challenges, contemplating strategies to prevent the government under Republican leadership from enabling President Biden to borrow without limits. Congressman McGregor underscores the imminent risk of violating the Constitution, which vests such decisions in the hands of the House of Representatives. Essentially, one cannot simply push a button and generate money within the Treasury. While expressing solidarity with the suffering Ukrainians, McGregor shifts the conversation to the imperative of politicians saving lives. He advocates for a greater emphasis on diplomatic efforts to persuade everyone that the only viable resolution is a ceasefire. He asserts the conviction that there is no chance of winning the war, emphasizing the need for increased diplomatic energy to facilitate a ceasefire followed by peace talks. This, he contends, would align with a broader goal of preserving lives within the international political community. Douglas McGregor provides a pragmatic perspective on Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, acknowledging the Hungarian people's general pragmatism he appreciates Orban's ability to communicate in English, considering the inherent security in the Hungarian language known only to Hungarians. McGregor commends Orban's realism, particularly in his assessment of the differences between the Soviet era and the current Russian state. He takes issue with the comparison, stressing that the rationale for intervention today is unrelated to the mindset of the Soviet Union. McGregor expresses discontent with the prevailing sentiment that Putin and Russia are synonymous with the Soviet Union, a belief he attributes to misguided thinking. He highlights Orban's acknowledgement of this misconception before stating unequivocally 
that the Ukrainians have no chance of winning and European nations are unlikely to deploy troops. Despite consistent assertions to this effect, McGregor laments that it has not altered the situation. In the last 24 hours, Eugenie Prego has issued intriguing statements emphasizing the imperative of mobilization. He underscores the necessity to assemble two million individuals who are not merely mobilized, but also well-trained and prepared, cautioning against becoming mere meat. The urgency in his words implies a direct message aimed at reaching the ears of President Putin, and some of the content appears disconcerting. Prego contends that unless we achieve mobilization, success in the ongoing special operation is unattainable. His call extends to the entire nation, urging it to transition into a state of war, emphasizing the need for society to be mobilized and prepared for the prospect of living under these conditions for an extended period. In the last 24 hours, Eugenie Prego has issued intriguing statements emphasizing the imperative of mobilization. He underscores the necessity to assemble two million individuals who are not merely mobilized, but also well-trained and prepared, cautioning against becoming mere meat. The urgency in his words implies a direct message aimed at reaching the ears of President Putin, and some of the content appears disconcerting. Prego contends that unless we achieve mobilization, success in the ongoing special operation is unattainable. His call extends to the entire nation, urging it to transition into a state of war, emphasizing the need for society to be mobilized and prepared for the prospect of living under these conditions for an extended period. Douglas McGregor comments on the recent developments, stating that though it might be a smaller warhead, it still holds significant destructive potential. Initially, the commitment was against providing such long-range strike weapons to the Ukrainians, but now there's a sudden shift in stance. McGregor notes that from a Russian perspective, these announcements convey a, a sense of escalation with each passing statement especially when President Biden addresses the situation. He recalls the initial assurance of not sending tanks or aircraft in limiting actions to defensive purposes, a commitment that has seemingly evaporated, replaced by a competitive one-upmanship mentality, blocking the decision to send four 16s without the necessary support infrastructure. McGregor predicts the likelihood of further escalations, including potential requests for F-15s. He highlights the recent comments by Putin specifically addressing the strike on the military intelligence headquarters in Kiev within the last 24 hours. The situation, according to McGregor, seems to be moving towards a spiral of continuous escalation with each new development. Douglas McGregor provides his analysis, suggesting that the recent strike on the military intelligence headquarters in Kiev was likely carried out by either an Iskander missile tactical or ballistic missile or a Kinshasa missile. He expresses concern over the significant loss of life and the destruction of the entire headquarters. Notably, McGregor speculates that several NATO officers may have been casualties, a detail that remains conspicuously absent from public discourse, an omission he finds concerning. He emphasizes the importance of transparency and the need for the truth to be disclosed, particularly if American, French, British, or other officers are among the casualties. McGregor acknowledges Putin's prior discussions about targeting decision centers and points out that Russian intelligence has comprehensive knowledge of the locations of such centers. He underscores the effectiveness of overhead surveillance, noting Russia's capabilities akin to the National Security Agency and the IA. With this technological advantage, McGregor suggests that Russian forces can systematically target these headquarters housing the so-called decision makers. Douglas McGregor asserts that what we're witnessing is just the beginning. The narrative now suggests that we must hold the line in Ukraine until the Russians retreat. However, McGregor dismisses the notion that the Russians will retreat. Instead, he predicts they will advance, consolidating their gains up to the Dinopa River, reclaiming cities like Kharkov and Odessa. He anticipates a temporary pause before a potential move towards the Polish border establishing a significant presence there. Doors is critical questions. What needs to happen beforehand? Magra Gregor points to the outlawing of Pogosian, emphasizing that the current situation has effectively driven Russia to the brink of national war mobilization. He expresses his concern and criticizes the decision makers, 
including President Biden and figures like Lindsey Graham, for placing the region in such a precarious position. McGregor contends that the actions taken so far have unintentionally gifted Europe with the presence of two million Russian troops on its borders. A scenario, he suggests, nobody desires.